this is a presentation Scott actually gave at the National Pavement Preservation Conference in, uh, in Nashville. And uh, going through it, he, he only had 62 slides <laughs> instead of the 47 Jerry had. Uh, and there were 62 that were uh, relatively technical in nature. Uh, I have uh, removed most of the technical in nature unless somebody really wants the graphs on massacre and creep recovery and stress and strain and, and, and JNR and all those things. Uh, if you want those, let me know afterwards. I'll give you the other presentation and you can stumble through on your own. Um, I'm going to kind of talk as an overview about just things that are going on that you may or may not have heard about or may, may not have seen across the U.S. And I'll, I'll try to talk a little slower than I did last time, but I'll still get done early for you, Gary. Thank you. So the first one is, uh, this is an advanced uh, polymer that's being used in slurry and micro applications uh, in various places across the U.S. Kind of as a, uh, as a warm up, you know, slurry seals are one stone, micros are multiple stones, and you put them down on a decent road. Uh, let's set the stage. Uh, imagine a four-year road, old, good, old, in good shape, no cracks. Uh, only slight, moderate chain wear. Maybe some snow tire wear. Running in the wheel pass. I'm trying to be more Metcalf here. Uh, no cracks. 7,080T. Now imagine that one lane is slurry sealed, the other is mic road, and a control section is untouched. Well, what does it look like six years later? It looks pretty much like this. Slurry, micro and no maintenance at all. The entire road was in the same condition when it started. So laying a straight edge across it, you see the slurry seal actually looks pretty well, has had some, some minor removal of uh, part of the material due to the chain wear up there. Microsurface has actually done, had done really well on this. So again, I guess what we're trying to show here and what, what Scott's trying to say is uh, what we've talked about for the last two days, pavement preservation works. Um, in this case, it worked on, on a road that was in, uh, like I said, four years old, sort of rough shape, doing nothing, left you with this, i.e. a California road, and then this is probably the joint between California and Nevada based on the picture I saw in the, in the NDOT presentation where it said, welcome to Nevada, and I saw the pothole in the California side, and then the Nevada road looks smooth. Did I mention I was a co-chair on the Pavement Preservation Task Force in California with Shree and his guys? So the other place we see a lot of uh, pavement preservation going on and a lot of new things being tried is at the test track. And uh, Scotty just threw in some pictures here of, of various things at the test track. The thing he's trying to get everybody to understand is part of the research goals at the test track are to promote real innovation in the industry, uh, along with the other things that, that everybody else has already talked about and, and that continues to talk about. So let's talk about one. Uh, this happened to be a, an article done up in the New England Construction Journal. Up at Dartmouth, they tried some new uh, generation uh, pavement preservation. And basically, what are they looking at new in polymer modification and asphalt emulsions is, and again, this is Scott's slide. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to depart at times from his slides, just like I did with Jerry's, just not as quickly. Typically, anything over a 4% polymer uh, in, in our slurry or micro emulsions has been hard to work with. Uh, I, I know NDOT has, a, uh, has some specs, and Washoe County has some 4% some with a 64-65 residue. Even the city of Roseville has that. Uh, it, it can be a little bit of a bear to work with, uh, hard to emulsify, and, and, and the controls and the ability to work with it in the field can get a little more difficult. So um, there's kind of a new one out that, that they're using a, a basically a 6% polymer in the base stock and then emulsifying it. With that, the idea is what are the expectations? And the expectations to, to determine whether or not this, a new technology works in this case, uh, they used two, two methods to try to uh, verify whether or not this new technology would be as effective. First, the Contabro test, and it's not the Contabro test, it's, I think that's an A, and then the uh, on-the-road demonstrations and projects. I'll show you a little bit about both of those. First of all, if, you don't, if you're not familiar with the Contabro, basically you create a puck, you put it in the LA Rattler, you roll it around, and you see how much falls off. There's the technical part of the presentation. Here's your mold specimen. Here's what it looks like for the, for the, for the Canucks. It's a hockey puck. So mass loss after being in the uh, Cantabro or the LA Rattler and rolling around for a while. This happened to be a CQS1H, a micro standard, probably 62 res with a 3% polymer. And then this was the high mod micro that they tried up in Dartmouth. Uh, less than four uh, hundredths of a, a loss on that. Pretty, pretty nice piece. Um, there's what they look like again. Pictures are worth a thousand words. Uh, you can see that, that this really does have a nice, relatively sharp edge compared to that old conventional slurry 
is it holding up? It's holding up better. Uh, that's the graph form for the, for the uh, I was going to say geeks, but I was going to say engineers uh, or geeks. Um, that's the graph. D it worked in the lab. It shows some promise, but does it work in the field? That's the question. So this is the, uh, this is the really technical te part of the presentation. This is the technical test that's run. Uh, you park a pickup truck there, and then you turn the wheels back and forth four or five times, and you see if it grinds off the road. Very, very technical. You've got to have the specific weight, a specific amount of gas in the truck. No, you don't need it. Just park the truck and roll the wheels, see what happens. So this happens to be a CQS versus the high mod CQS. Um, and, and the thing to notice here is the amount of the depth of damage that you did on the, the standard old CQS versus more of a scuff effect on the high mod. So that high mod, high polymer content um, is working. It does show. Here's another one of the same. Because here it says 11 months, but then he doesn't show the pictures of the result there. Here he says one week after a laydown, down here at the bottom. So this is supposedly one week after a laydown. And then here's a, uh, this is the La Quinta area, Palm Springs, really hot down there. Always have trouble with, with uh, some bleeding, flushing, movement of the materials down there, getting it soft, it hits the softening point, everything starts to want to move around. Uh, same type of deal, you can see some marks from the standard 2.5% slurry, and then basically a, just a rub on the surface from the high mod. Cul-de-sacs, you know, we all know that the cul-de-sacs uh, like to ravel off. You can see quite a bit of loose gravel on this one. That's a standard LMCQS, and that's the high mod version that they tried again up in Dartmouth. Crack resistance, because it's a high modulus material with a lot of polymer in it uh, prior to emulsification, they are seeing some crack reflectivity. Uh, as long as I've been in this business, uh, and Gary said since 91, I, we've never talked about crack resistance with microsurfacings and slurries. They're not meant for it. They're harder. They're tougher. Uh, they're meant to be a wearing surface. Uh, there, this shows some promise and potential is what I'm trying to say. I, I'm, I'm impressed with what I see. Um, Salt Lake area, same thing, done in 2013, and then you're looking at that same church in the background. Uh, I'm assuming that's a church. Uh, same crack pattern, you can see there's not so much coming through on the surface. So I think the high mod micro, like I said, it's, uh, if, you, if you look in the New England Construction Magazine, you can find the article on there, you can read it. Again, I'm not here to endorse or not endorse, I'm kind of here to say these are new things that are out there. Let's talk a little bit about rubber tire products in pavement preservation. Uh, you know, we, we've all used the chip seal version of that, uh, we, we know what's going on there. The next thing we're kind of talking about and trying in some areas is uh, using ground tire rubber in slurry seal applications. Um, here you see uh, 30 mesh ground tire rubber. Uh, basically, uh, this happens to be a 5% uh, where you're taking basically 100 grams of material, adding 5% of ground tire rubber, you end up with 105 grams. So what are we doing? And this is more of a California thing, Sri. We're on the ball and innovative and moving forward on our group, aren't we, Sri? So California spec, we're attempting to do a 10% minimum ground tire rubber by weight of binder. We don't care how you get it in there for the most part. We're saying, yes, we want to reuse tires. We want to, we want to instead, of, instead of putting them in that landfill, we want to make our, I'm not going to go there. We're going to use them in other places to hopefully benefit the pavements. So there's a couple different incorporation processes for that uh, for that little bit of tire you saw back there, like I said, we're doing 10% in California. By way of emulsion, there are people adding it uh, on the machines via the fines feeders. There are people that are blending it into the aggregate, and then when the aggregate goes into the truck, you know it's already in there. There are people that are blending it into asphalt and emulsifying it, or there are people that are blending it into another component and then combining that with an emulsion and ending up with a finished product. Uh, and then there are people that are adding it to the emulsion. Okay, so I think that's all the different ways people are attempting to get 10% ground tire into a slurry or a microsurfacing. But what good is it if it doesn't work? That's why all performance criteria, no matter how you're going to go ahead and incorporate that ground tire rubber, have to meet the ISSA performance criteria for either slurry or micro. We don't want a weaker micro or a weaker slurry because we're adding ground tire rubber. We want something that we're recycling a component, uh, maybe getting an added benefit out of it, uh, getting a better product out of it. We don't want to go backwards with our, our preservation products and, and step back. So that's, uh, that's what we're trying to do. Uh, this just shows it going through a fine feeder. This is the easy part of the presentation. 
Here's a street that was done, and it's black like any street would be, whether it had tire in it or not, but it's a pretty picture. Pretty pictures. Uh, here's a plant, and uh, Scott Metcalf will explain this slide to you and every one of those pipes next time you see them. Here's uh, some tire rubber modified slurry seal emulsion being placed uh, as a slurry, or is it microsurfacing? Uh, apparently we have the picture, but we just didn't know which one it was. Rubber products in slurries and micros, what's being attempted, uh, like I said, California, we're, we're in the process of finishing a spec and, and hopefully going to have that go through committee very soon, put out there for, uh, for some test projects and uh, start to see some, uh, some of that innovation move forward. So the next thing that we're trying that's kind of new out there in industry, wrap and pavement preservation. How many guys are using recycled asphalt in pavement preservation treatments? See a couple of hands, okay. Using them in chip seals? Hands, chip seals? Slurry seals. Where are you using your wrap then in pavement preservation? Hot mix. Hot in place, okay. Well, we're trying some things a little differently in uh, Southern California and in, in California in general, they're actually taking the wrap, crushing it and sizing it all the way down to a chip size and a slurry and micro size. And reusing those materials in either slurries, micros, or straight chip seals. LA County has been one of the, the people that have pushed this process forward. They've required uh, in some of their specifications, 100% use of our re use of 100% recycled materials for their chip seals and their slurry seals and their microsurfacings. Uh, it does work. This happens to be a picture of a, a wrap aggregate with that high mod micro again. Um, they're taking it from the standard milling where you're getting it, taking it to a a, a plant where it can be crushed, sized, screened, get it. It still has to meet all the criteria for all those sizes you need and you still have to be able to do the mixed designs you want to do with it, but the average breakdown from a standard wrap job, if you're just milling off a pavement somewhere, they're getting about 45% chip, 50% slurry dust, and 5% other. So it is a great reuse of a material that, uh, as they say, hot mix asphalt pavements are the most recycled thing in the United States. You can take plastic bottles all you want, but HMA pavements are the most recycled. This is just another way to use them in your neck of the woods. So uh, here's, here's the gist on this. Uh, wrap finds have to be fresh. Material that has been stored or stockpiled too long, they need to rescreen it. it why, what's going to happen to a wrap pot, fine wrap stockpile if it's sitting around too long? It'll start to melt back together. Of course it will. That's what it does. Stockpile management, don't pile too much. A uh, couple of things you need to look out for. Uh, loading trucks the night before has become an issue. Uh, once it starts to come out of those trucks, it's, it's more of a cube. Minimum requirement, of uh, they are using at least 3% uh, polymer in these materials that they're doing. Mostly using rubber tire rollers. There is a concern with the high traffic areas because you've got a completely pre-coated material. Put too much asphalt in that and you could end up with some flushing or bleeding. So you gotta be a little bit careful with that. And then the uh, wrap chip, you know, I, I basically what they're trying to say here is the, the recycled products are valuable. There's a lot of value in the pavement. It's your pavement, you own it. Instead of milling it up and giving it back to somebody else that's gonna basically resell it to somebody else, Maybe find a way to stockpile it, get it crushed and screen, and reuse it on your project and save yourself some money. So the last one that Scott had here, since I cut his 62 slides down to 43, was scrub seals in pavement preservation. How many are using scrub seals? we got a couple out there that are trying scrub seals. This is a uh, Southern California job. Evaluation lane was chipped and swept in five hours. This is actually pretty impressive to have that surface not be reflecting these cracks. That's... Uh, that's one of the better ones I have seen. Uh, we've done a lot of scrub seals over the years. One of the interesting things is that now that I understand what a Texas under seal is, thank you, uh, Mr. Woods, for telling me what that is. Uh, basically, that's, that's a great application for an overlay prior to. Fill those cracks back in. It's kind of like that puzzle glue you know, you had for your kid when they put the puzzle together and they wanted to keep it. And you just kind of glued it all over top and it settled into the cracks and made one solid piece. It's kind of what we're doing with these scrub seals kind of taking a really bad road and trying to hold it back together. If you got a lot of pumping going on, if you got a lot of moisture underneath there, it's not going to hold up, but it is one of those things. We talked yesterday, I heard Gary mention three-layer systems. A lot of places in California, we're either using a micro or a scrub seal as that first lift to kind of choke everything back together and, and glue it together. This, uh, this just shows the scrub broom in action. In California, we call it a PMRE. Here they named it a CMS-1PC. You can see that you can still see the crack pattern underneath a little bit. 
and then after it's chipped, uh, this is before and after, you will see some reflection of those cracks coming through that. But typically there's a second or maybe even a third layer that go on top of this. You put a good micro on top of this, you can get quite a few years out of it. In the future, anybody just get a hold of me, let me know, my contact information's up there. And uh, if you have questions on this presentation, uh, <laughs> call Scott Metcalf. The preceding video was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found at tsp2.org. That's tsp2.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.